this, there's a lot of information to cover. I'm going to try to keep it as succinct as possible. Um, please hold your questions till the end or put them in the chat. Uh, and uh, I will try to get to them as, easy, as quickly as I can uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, I am an author. I am a disabled veteran. Uh, I am open about my disabilities. I have PTSD. I also broke my back while I was in the Navy. And um, at one point in time in my life, uh, about 10 years ago, I woke up in the morning to take uh, the first round of the 32 pills a day that the VA prescribed me of 11 different medications. I would wake up at seven to take my pills. I would literally lay in bed all day, eight hours, and then take my pills and go back to sleep. And that was quote unquote life at that point in time in, 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 in my life. Um, at some point, while I literally was a VA zombie, I decided that that wasn't living and I needed to do something different. And uh, my wife at the time suggested a service dog and that's how my journey began. Oftentimes the choice to use a service dog, especially for veterans with PTSD is the last, it's the, it's the, there's nothing left. I've tried everything else. I've taken all the drugs. I might as well try a service dog. Um, it's that in, in my opinion is asked backwards. The service dog does a lot less damage to your liver, your kidneys, your brain, um, than the medications do. Uh, however, and this may sound cynical, but if you really start digging into it with the VA, the service dogs don't kick back big pharma money to the Department of Veterans Affairs. There's no money in it for the VA. I think that's the primary reason the VA opposes the use of service dogs. There's good news, however. The VA doesn't have to approve of your use of a service dog because you are a citizen of the United States of America. And you have the right under the Americans with Disabilities Act to train and handle a service dog to assist you with your disabilities. And that's what we're going to talk about. So first of all, I mentioned a law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, passed in 1990, signed into law by the senior President Bush. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act is an equal rights law. It is a civil rights law guaranteeing equal rights of access to all people, no matter what their level of ability. The ADA is not a law about service dogs. The use of service dogs happens to be one of the things that is protected on behalf of disabled people under the ADA. However, the ADA is not about service dogs. Service dogs are under the umbrella. They are included, but it is not exclusive about service dogs. It's important to understand the, the primary point, the most important thing to understand when we understand the use of service dogs in American society is that it is a right that is protected. It is a civil right protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act for disabled people. Hey, I'm sorry, my puppy is acting up. I have my service dog Skeeter right here to my right. Our family pet Freya sitting on the couch teasing my prospect, which is an English Mastiff puppy. <laughs> so we might hear a little, uh, a little noise. Okay, back to civil rights. So we all know about the, the civil rights movement in 1964 when uh, race, creed, religion, uh, we, were, we were guaranteed or protected a level playing field um, at that point in time by, by law. Uh, discrimination could not be made because of the color of your skin, who you worshiped, um, or things like that. That was, that was codified into law. It took... From 1964 to 1990, almost 30 years, for a law to be passed to guarantee the equality of disabled people. And I, I can't stress how important this is enough that the, that the law protects the right to be treated equally to equal access for disabled people. Uh, the things that the ADA uh, put into uh, uh, requirement was things like um, wheelchair access, ramps, uh, ramps on, on curbs, you know, cutouts on curbs so that wheelchairs could get on and off the sidewalks, uh, disabled parking spaces, wider doors and buildings. 
both in elevators and, and if buildings didn't have elevators, elevators had to be installed so that people with disabilities had the ability to move around the, with the same freedom as able-bodied people. In that, they codified again the use of a service dog trained to work or perform tasks to assist a disabled person with their disability. That's some very specific wording. I'm going to say it again. The ADA protects the right of a disabled person to handle a service dog trained to do work or perform tasks to assist that person with their disability. So there's a couple of things we can take out of that. First of all, no matter how well trained the dog is, I don't care if the dog can pick up a pen and write out the Magna Carta. If you're not disabled, it's not a service dog. Some states protect the right of able people to train service dogs for disabled people. That is a state law. Under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the federal law, if you're not disabled, the ADA does not protect your right to take a dog anywhere. If you are disabled, then if the dog is trained to do work or perform tasks to assist you with your disability, then the law protects your right to take that dog almost anywhere with you, within reason. There are some places you can't take your service dog. For example, you can go to any restaurant, any bar, any hotel, any store, any club with your service dog. You have the right to be accompanied by that dog because it is there to assist you with your disability. However, in the restaurant, although you can go through the uh, buffet line or the salad bar with your service dog, you can't go into the food preparation areas for obvious reasons. Um, it, it, that's a matter of health and safety. The ADA does spell out that the health and safety of other customers uh, is still of concern when a person is, is present with their service dog. Um, however, anywhere that most customers would normally go, able or disabled, a customer who uses a service dog can go. This access is governed by the Americans with Disabilities Act. There are two other laws that govern access in different places with service dogs. The second is the Fair Housing Act. That is uh, maintained and managed by HUD. The Fair Housing Act gives disabled people the right to not to be charged uh, uh, pet fees or extra fees cleaning fees and things like that if they use a service dog and they cannot be denied even in no dog housing uh, they cannot be denied the ability to rent access equal to anybody else if they use a service dog there are some exceptions to that however if a landlord has five or more properties or if they use a rental management company they fall under the fair housing act and they must permit disabled people who use service dogs to stay without charging them extra for the service dog. Why? Because under both laws, the service dog is classified as durable medical equipment. In other words, a service dog and a wheelchair legally are the same thing. We do not treat our service dogs like wheelchairs. Don't get, mis get the mistake that we treat our dogs like their, their gear. They are not. They are living beings. However, legally, disabled people have the right, just like they have the right to use a wheelchair, to use a service dog and to have free access. Um, the third law is the Air Carriers Access Act. This is um, under review right now. The service dog rules are under review because the ACAA was written and passed before the uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act and the final rules for service animals under the Americans with Disabilities Act, that wasn't finalized until 30 years after the law was passed in 2010. So 99% of the service dog handlers in the United States that you run across today are under the rules that were finalized in 2010. Before 2010, there were some things that were different. Um, one of those things was that emotional support animals for people with uh, mental health disabilities were 
covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act to be able to go places with their handlers. Well, we've seen that in the emotional support animal creates issues. We've seen that in the Air Carriers Access Act. Emotional support animals are literally pets. The only thing special about it is that you are disabled uh, emotionally or, or mentally, and that animal's presence gives you comfort. It can be a bunny rabbit, it can be a lizard. Uh, you know, some people take comfort of, out of the presence of some interesting animals, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. However, when it comes to going into public and go, take, making access to places like stores, uh, dormitories, libraries, um, movie theaters, restaurants, animals need to be trained adequately in order to be able to handle the stresses. These are not normal environments for your family dog. Um, that is why the ADA in 2010 made a very specific distinction between service animals and emotional support animals. And for those of you at UCLA, you're, you, I'm sure, <laughs> hush, Skeeter, hush. I'm sure you run into the uh, issue with emotional support animals in the dormitories. <clears throat> Let me read you from the uh, document, the first document that I linked in the comments. It is ada.gov slash regs2010 slash service underscore animal underscore qa.html. It is the frequently asked questions about service animals. Stop. Service animals in the ADA. Remember, Melissa, what I told you about him being the grumpy old man saying, you kids get off that lawn? That's what you're hearing. Okay. Um, question three on the, free, the ADA's frequently asked questions is, are emotional support, therapy, comfort, or companion animals considered service animals under the ADA? And the answer is no. These terms are used to describe animals that provide comfort just by being with a person because they have not been trained to perform a specific job or task, they do not qualify as service animals under the ADA. However, some state or local governments have laws that allow people to take emotional support animals into public places. You may check with your state and local government agencies to find out about these laws. All right, most of what I'm talking about today is federal law federally under the Americans with Disabilities Act, an emotional support animal is not covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. You cannot take it grocery shop with, shopping with you. You cannot take it to the, to the hotel with you. There is, you have no protection under the Americans with Disabilities Act for general public access with an emotional support animal. They are covered under the Fair Housing Act and have similar status as service animals in that the, a, a confirmed emotional support animal cannot be, uh, uh, the owner cannot be charged uh, pet fees. However, <clears throat> under the uh, Fair Housing Act, as recently updated in January, if it is a task trained service dog, housing providers can only ask, is that a service dog required because of a disability uh, and what tasks or work is the dog trained to perform. The same is under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So the ADA and now HUD with the FHA have leveled the playing field for task trained service dogs. We'll get into those questions again here in a few minutes. The Air Transportation, the Air Carriers Access Act uh, still has provisions for emotional support animals and still draws a line between a psychiatric service dog and a service dog for other purposes. It lumps psychiatric service dogs together with emotional support animals. And there are requirements. You have to have a note from your doctor that saying that you're disabled and that you use a psychiatric service dog to assist with your disability. Here's the thing. Under the ADA, which is the law that governs the use of service animals from the get-go, and under fair housing, task-trained service dog is a task-trained service dog regardless of the disability. So smart travelers, smart service dog handlers flying, just say, yes, it is a task trained service dog and name one or two of the dog's tasks. Okay, that's the smart way to answer that question. You're not lying, you're not violating the law and you're not disclosing your disability. Guess what? 
with the exception of employment under Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act, you are not required to disclose your disability at any time. Let me put that in different words. Businesses are prohibited from asking you what your disability is. Why do you have that dog? That's actually federally illegal to ask. We'll, we'll get into that. Uh, we're going to move past that and, and start talking about public access. So as a service dog handler, a disabled person, I have the right to have a service dog. Some, some misconceptions we need to clear up real quick. I have the right to train that service dog myself. I do not have to get it from an organization. It does not have to be certified by anybody. Um, it does not matter where the dog was trained as long as the dog is trained. One of the biggest arguments you'll hear from large training organizations, who I will not name, is that the ADA does not have behavioral standards. That is not true. The ADA specifically says that the dog must be trained to do work or perform tasks to assist the handler with a disability, that the dog must be under the handler's control at all times, and if the dog is not under control, the handler must take immediate effective action to regain control. The dog must be clean and well-groomed, and the dog must be thoroughly housebroken. Now, under control means different things to different people, but we can say very generally, if the dog's not barking, jumping up and down on people, knocking, uh, well, I'm not going to say knocking things over. Skeeter's a happy dog, and his tail weighs about three pounds, and it hits like a baseball bat. So <laughs> he does knock things over accidentally, but intentionally knocking things over, jumping up on shelves and, or lifting their leg in an aisle in the grocery store, that dog does not qualify, does not meet the requirements of the ADA to be a service dog. Businesses have the right, also protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act, to ask that a dog that is not under control, is not housebroken, or is filthy, be removed from the business. If a dog is excluded, the business is still required to provide the goods and services to the handler. However, if the dog does not meet the requirements of the ADA, the business has every right to ask that that dog be removed. For example, a dog that barks incessantly in the store, every time it sees something, barks its head off, can, that is not under control and that dog can be removed. However, one of the things that we need to remember is that a dog is trained to assist their handler with their disability. And if the handler's ignoring the dog, the dog's gonna do the same thing your kids do when you're not listening to your kids. Mommy, 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 mommy! Okay, yes, Freya, that's the reactive pet. All right, come here. Freya, it's okay. So, same thing, okay? She's not under control. This is why she does not qualify to be a service dog. Okay, a service dog will escalate its responses if it's, it's alerts to its handler if the handler's not listening. One bark because the handler's not listening to get the handler's attention does not mean the dog is out of control and does not mean that the dog should be excluded. Another exception is if the dog is provoked. For example, I had a handler contact me on the PTS dog Facebook page in a panic because she was waiting in line at the grocery store and a man started staring at her service dog. Staring, if you don't know dogs, making eye contact with a dog is usually perceived by most breeds as a threat. If you continue locked eye contact with that dog, that dog's going to start to bristle and react because it feels like it is being threatened. If the dog at that is being provoked in that manner and lets out a bark to let the handler know, she was in line to check out for groceries. She wasn't focused on the man staring at her dog. She was focused on being in line for groceries. This guy ended up growling and barking at her service dog in order to provoke a response. And when the dog responded, started yelling, that's not a real service dog. Well, guess what? 
the law actually says if the dog is provoked, its natural reaction is acceptable as long as the handler takes immediate effective reaction, uh, re, uh, action to regain control. Okay, so we need to remember that one of the things that a lot of these organizations who like to claim that there's no behavioral standards under the ADA, one of the things they like to ignore is the fact that a dog is a living animal, not a robot. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you expect robotic behavior from your service dog, don't get a service dog, get a robot. Sorry, that, that seems heartless, but I'm, I'm telling you flat out, if you expect your dog to behave like a robot, find a robot. Don't get a dog. Okay. Um, rights. So again, the handler has a right protected by the law, but the businesses also have a right. And if you, if you are not fulfilling your responsibilities under the Americans with Disabilities Act to train your dog, to do work or perform tasks to assist you with your disability, to keep that dog under control in public settings, which means train your dog, okay? To keep your dog groomed and clean and to make sure your, house, your dog is housebroken. Again, training. Notice three of the four points use the word training. Train your dog to work and perform tasks. Train your dog to remain under control in public. House train your dog well, well groomed and clean. So training are the three most important points of what qualifies a dog under the ADA. The, the fifth, clean and, and well groomed being number four. The first point and most important being is the handler disabled. Okay, if you don't meet these five points, it's not a service dog, and it doesn't belong in public with you. Um, <clears throat> so let's get back to where do I, or let's move to where do I get a service dog? Okay. Uh, for disabled veterans, it's a really easy question to answer. Just about anywhere you turn. There are hundreds of organizations, if not thousands, in the United States that train service dogs for disabled veterans. It's really easy to find a service dog if you're a veteran. One organization I recommend the most highly is called Tadsod.org. Train a dog, save a warrior. The reason I recommend Tadsod the most for, for veterans with PTSD is because Tadsod uses the cooperative training model, which means that the veteran is connected with a dog and the veteran and the dog attend classes regularly to train both the veteran and the dog to be a service dog team. This focuses on the bond created between the dog and the handler. And when we're talking about psychiatric service dogs or PTSD service dogs or <clears throat> MST survivor a service dog, when we're talking about dogs, especially that are responding to the mental health of their handler, everything that dog does for that handler revolves around the bond between that handler and that dog. Skeeter intervenes for me when PTSD has got me at, at, at my worst because he knows that there's something wrong and he can actually intervene before I get to the point of being triggered when I am being stressed so that the trigger does not get pulled. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about PTSD and let's talk about the word triggered. I hate that word. I despise it because it has been co-opted and misused outside of the mental health realm um, grossly. However, sometimes the word triggered is the right word. What happens when a trigger gets pulled? Something downrange is destroyed. When you pull the trigger, the weapon is fired and something downrange is destroyed. Well, that is a very good description of PTSD. You get stressed to the point where that switch flips in your head and you are triggered and you can't control what comes out of your mouth. Some people can't control their bodies. They are violent. Uh, it's the, something downrange gets destroyed. So I trained my dog by 
building a bond with him to respond to stressors in order to prevent me from reaching the point where I am triggered. Because once the trigger is pulled, something downrange gets destroyed. And unfortunately, especially for veterans with PTSD, when that something downrange gets destroyed, handcuffs usually follow. So the, one of the key things that the, that the service dog does for the veteran with PTSD um, is the dog is there to redirect the veteran's attention to him or her rather than whatever is going on in their environment that is causing so much stress that they're getting ready to reach the point where that switch is flipped and they run into fight or flight response mode. Perfect example of this is with me and Skeeter. Um, I had a mental health appointment with a counselor in uh, Cadillac, Michigan at the VA. And uh, we had, this was our second appointment. The first appointment we went in, introdu introductions and everything. And of course, we're, we're in a very tiny room, like six by eight office, two chairs and a desk taking up most of the space and a giant 100 pound Malamute, my service dog. Of course, he wanted to check out this person that he was sitting in the same room with and make sure that person was safe. I let him do that. That's part of his job. He's my forward observer. He decided she wasn't dangerous and he sat down, but he insisted that he check her out. Well, to the best of my knowledge, I can graciously call her a cat person. So I show up for my next appointment the next week and I am immediately physically cornered in the lobby of the VA with my back to a row of chairs and the empty room behind me. And if you're a veteran with PTSD, you understand that at that situation where my back is not against a wall, I cannot see what's going on behind me, but I am busy being physically pushed into a position where I have to defend myself. That's what my brain's saying. So God, what, they're going to jump me. Okay. Immediate panic. Um, that was a bad idea. So it turns out this was the director of this little satellite clinic and one of his employees who happened to train hunting dogs. What Skeeter did is what saved me that day. Skeeter immediately intervened, put his body between them and me so they could not approach closer than about two and a half feet across the shoulders of my 100 pound dog. And he sat on my foot. That is the level one alert. Hey, dad, this is not right. You're starting to stress. Pay attention to me. That is what I trained him to do in a situation where the stress became so difficult that I was starting to ramp up towards fight or flight response. These two said that the accusation was made last week that your dog is aggressive. And again, he's sitting on my foot. When a hundred pound dog sits on your foot, you have one choice and one choice only. You drop your hand onto their head and start petting them. This has been medically proven through several studies. When you pet a dog or an animal to release endorphins, lower stress levels, lower uh, adrenaline and oxytocin levels, release endorphins and calm you. Okay, so the first thing I did is start petting the dog who was sitting on my foot, letting me know, hey, you're stressing. He then went to level two and started pushing me away from them, except my back was against these chairs. So I had nowhere to go. So I couldn't be upset with him because he was doing what he was trained to do, push me away from the stressor. Okay. But I acknowledged to him, yes, thank you. I understand. And addressed them. No. I, and what I did was look straight into the guy who said this, uh, the accusation made, was made that this dog is aggressive. I looked straight in his eye and said, is this dog aggressive? Mind you, the dog's attention was 100% on me because I was at that point right on the verge of fight or flight. And he looked back and he said, no, he's not. And I said, I know who made the, the complaint because it was the counselor. It was obvious. That was the only person I had interaction with. And I said, <clears throat> now, here's where I was right and wrong. According to the Americans with Disabilities Act, fear of dogs and allergies are not an adequate reason to deny service. However, the Department of Veterans Affairs does not fall under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So what I did was says, if the counselor is incapable of being professional 
and putting aside her fear, then I want another provider. The clinic director said, fair enough, and went back to the back to go talk to the counselor. In the meantime, I asked the other guy, if we could move away from having my back against a, a row of chairs in open rooms, because at that point I was shaking, he let me move, change position with Skeeter. I was able to interact with Skeeter and calm myself some more. Um, and his only criticism of me and Skeeter is that I let other veterans talk to my service dog. Well, that's my personal choice. There's nothing in the law that says I can't allow my dog to interact with other people. I do it for a very specific reason. One of the symptoms of my PTSD is that I was horribly socially isolated. I would not talk to, I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for my service dog. I could not talk to other people. I wouldn't give you the time of day. I would go out of my way to avoid interacting with other human beings. But once I started using my service dog, I discovered that I could talk to anybody all day long about my dog. So he became a bridge. I trained him to greet people appropriately, to sit calmly and let them pet him. And he became the physical bridge between me and other people because I was comfortable talking about my dog. That started drawing me out of my shell. And social isolation no longer became a major issue or a major symptom of my disability. So that is a task that there are organizations will argue that's not a real task. Well, guess what? You don't have my symptoms. You don't have my disability. I do. And I train my dog to perform a task that directly affects my disability and allows me to overcome a very severe symptom of that disability. Okay, that's important. We need to keep that in the back of your mind. That's important when we go back to talking about where to get a service dog. Okay, but the point is, after everything was cleared up with the director and the counselor, I went back, was able to attend my appointment. By the way, I never rescheduled another appointment. I dropped counseling with that woman and later left the state, moved out of the state, so it wasn't an issue. But I will not work with somebody who's who goes so far in their dislike of my service dog to claim that he's, he's aggressive. That's just, that's just not professional behavior. <clears throat> um, okay. So that's why I, uh, I recommend cooperative training where the veteran and the dog train together. Here's the other reason I recommend cooperative training. Remember back in the ADA where it said that the handler had to maintain control of the dog at all times, or, if the dog was not under control, the handler had to take effective immediate action to regain control. Uh, Janice Bowman, I noticed a dog in the logo when you turned your camera off. Are you a dog trainer? I am. Um, I have a nonprofit called PAC and I do collaborative and cooperative training okay. in Los so, Angeles. So, yeah. so as a dog trainer, I'm sorry to call you out, but since I have a professional here, as a dog trainer, when you hear the terms effective action to regain control of the dog, what does that mean in your mind? Uh, effective control, typically I give about a 15 minute, uh, 15 second response time in order to be able to adequately uh, provide a, uh, a reaction and a response from the dog to get them back into a, a sit, a down, a stay, um, to, you know, ensure that they are back into a focused, attentive uh, state. Okay. Keyword right there, refocus the dog, get the dog to sit down, to get the dog to focus. What you are describing is training the dog. These are training actions. Okay. In other words, we're going back to service dogs not being robots. When you put a fully trained service dog's leash into the hands of somebody who wasn't actively involved in training the dog and the dog has a problem or an issue out in the store if that person holding the leash doesn't have a clue what to do how can they regain control <laughs> stop you two <laughs> okay so the the point i'm trying to come to is if the handler and the dog train together that handler learns how to train the good dog trainer 
is working themselves out of a job. That handler learns how to train their dog themselves. Because guess what? Dogs are not robots. Dogs are living, growing beings. And as they age, they change. Their needs change, their drives change, their motivation changes. And if you do not have the ability to change with them through training, you're going to end up with a dog you can't work in the framework of behavior of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Using a service dog is a process. And as the years have gone by, I've gone from with Skeeter. Now he's 10 years old. He's grouchy. There's a puppy in the house. That's what you hear him fussing at. He's literally the, the old man sitting on the, on the porch yelling, you kids get off my lawn. Okay. If people outside of the family who don't understand what is going on are going, why is that dog so aggressive? He's not. He's vocal. He's just talking to the other two and telling him to quit being kids. Um, <clears throat> he would never behave that way in a store. Why? Because we train. And part of the reason I, I, I really urge people to do cooperative training is my mindset when I take Skeeter to go grocery shopping is not that we're going grocery shopping. Now, I've been working him in public for almost eight years. And I still, to this day, don't go grocery shopping. I go train my dog at the grocery store. And groceries get in my cart while we're training. I've gone from an Alaskan Malamute is a dog that's bred to pull to last Thanksgiving, doing the entire shopping trip with his leash piled into the cart, still attached to him, but just laying in the cart. I never touched the leash once. We went up and down every aisle of the grocery store, never touched the leash. And he never pulled, he never wandered off. He never stuck his nose in the meat case because I took the time through the years of the process to train my dog. And the thing is, 10 years ago, he well, 10 years ago, he was just being born. Seven years ago, he was a completely different service dog than he is today. And we wouldn't be where we are where I could go grocery shopping without touching the leash if I hadn't trained my dog and learned to train him to make that training continuous. That is why I stress cooperative training so much. The big organizations that have a lot of money and a lot of advertising, especially out there in California, there's some very big ones with multi-million dollar budgets. <clears throat> they provide fully trained service dogs. And so they take a dog that gets roughly six months of actual training. They take veterans from all across the country, fly them out for a period of three weeks. They have a dozen dogs and a dozen veterans. The first week that that veteran's there of the three weeks, they cycle each veteran through each dog and see if there's any kind of spark. Do they get along? Okay, they sort of get along. Maybe we can pair these two. Well, the next week is spent doing just basic stuff. Sit, stay down, walk around. The third week, they take them out on public outings. Okay, but what they're not teaching them is their rights and responsibilities under the law. They're not teaching them how to work through issues if there is a behavioral problem, how to train through things. They're not giving, you can't learn how to train your dog in a week. I don't care who you are. It's impossible. Uh, they're not teaching them to um, problem solve or giving them resources to reach out to. And most importantly, out of all of that, they are not teaching them the service dog portions of the ADA. They are sending guys out with the brand new keys to a Maserati and the poor guys have never driven a stick in their lives and saying, here, it runs, it's great, it works great, go. And these guys are wrapping themselves around trees. Okay, there is no such thing as a fully trained service dog. It doesn't exist. I'm not saying there's not a place for third party training. There absolutely is a place and a time where you need a third party to train a service dog. Perfect example might be an autistic child where the parent is going to be the alternate handler because the child's incapable, but that dog helps assist the parent in keeping the child calm or keeping the child in one area. I'm not going to say corralled, but herded, um, you know. Okay, so that might mean, mean skills and, and things that a third party would train. However, again, that parent, that alternate handler, isn't learning how to work through issues, okay? 
And a perfect example might be an autistic child who likes to run. And so the dog's trained to herd the dog, to herd the child, get the child kind of corralled back and get them back. Okay. But the child's not listening. So the dog starts nipping because it's escalating. And when a herding dog is trying to get the sheep to move and the sheep aren't listening, it nips at them. So how do you train through that? How, what do you do? So here's this par frantic parent. Oh my God, my dog's biting the, my child. And they don't know what to do. This is, this is one of the major drawbacks of these third-party training organizations. Anybody who tells you we provide fully trained service dogs, look that gift horse in the mouth. Ask them, what do you teach your veterans about the law? What do you teach them about their rights? What do you teach them about their responsibilities? Now, we're going to go back to responsibilities under the ADA, and we're going to talk about the VA. Mm -hmm. Under the Americans with Disabilities Act, when you are holding the leash of the service dog, first of all, you are guaranteeing or certifying um, one that you're disabled because under the law, if you're not disabled, it's not a service dog. Two, that that dog is trained to work or perform tasks to assist you with your disability. Three, that that dog is trained to be able to handle public access. By walking into a store with the dog on the end of the leash, you are stating boldly, this is my service dog. It has been trained. It will behave. If the store is going to hold you responsible adequately, if the dog's misbehaving, the, the store has the right, but most stores are afraid to, to ask you to remove the animal. This is where we run into problems. This is why we have access. This is why there's a whole subculture out there of fake spotting which I absolutely despise. There's no such thing as a fake service dog. No dog wakes up in the morning and thinks to itself, you know, I'm going to put the service dog vest on today and go down to the Piggly Wiggly and pee in the meat aisle. No dog decides that. The problem is the person holding the leash. That person is responsible and is accountable. Whether it is a disabled person who has taken the time to train their dog appropriately or a liar who bought a vest on Amazon because they want to take Fifi the Wonder Poodle everywhere. It's not the dog's fault. And we've got to stop blaming the dogs. We need to hold people accountable. Off that soapbox. <clears throat> Under the ADA, the handler is responsible for ensuring their dog has appropriate training, is behaving appropriate, is under control, is housebroken, and is groomed. You done, Itchy? Um, that's the, that is the responsibility of the handler under the law. The handler is not responsible for educating the businesses. We're forced to often. The, handle is, the handler is not responsible for educating anybody, for answering questions to the public. We just want to go in and we want to do our, our, what we're there for. You know, uh, in my mindset, I'm there to train my dog and groceries fall into my cart. Okay but I'm working my dog the whole time. It's, it's constant with him. He and I communicate constantly. Okay. We're there to work. We're not there to, to entertain. Um, you know, my responsibility ends at maintaining my dog's uh, appropriate behavior so that my dog can in turn assist me with my disability. I don't have any other responsibilities when I walk into that store, but ensuring that dog is on his game. The store does have the right to ask two questions when I enter. Is that a service dog required because of a disability? And what tasks or work is that dog trained to perform? Those are the only questions stores, hotels, uh, restaurants, movie theaters, businesses can ask. Those are the only questions. They cannot ask about your disability. They cannot ask for proof or certification of the dog's training. They cannot ask that the dog demonstrate what its tasks are. They cannot demand paperwork. It is illegal. It is illegal under federal law. And so far, it's illegal under every state law. Okay. So when the business starts doing that, we're going to go back full circle. When a business is demanding paperwork or, or things, right? What they're doing is violating that handler's rights. Because that handler has the right to equal access, equal to anybody, whether they have a dog, a wheelchair, or are perfectly fine and able, okay? Because if I have to go, I'm Hispanic. If I have to 
show an ID that proves I'm an American uh, citizen in order to go shopping at the grocery store, I am no longer being treated equally. That is discrimination. In exactly the same manner, if I have to pull out a card, a certification, proving that my medical equipment, my durable medical equipment is actually medical equipment in order to have access, I'm not being treated equally. I'm being treated as a second-class citizen. If you're going to make service dog handlers certify their service dogs, then you have to make wheelchair users certify their wheelchairs. Hearing aid users certify and license their hearing aids. You see where this is going? The whole point of the ADA is to make it so that disabled people are no longer treated as second class citizens. So by requiring certification or registration, you're then making disabled handlers second class citizens. It's not gonna happen anytime soon. And honestly, again, it addresses the wrong issue. Dogs are not the problem. Holding people accountable for their behavior and their actions. That's where the focus needs to be. Don't focus on the dog. It's not a fake service dog. It's an untrained dog being led around by an uneducated or unscrupulous person who's lying or doesn't know any better. And that's the case often too. They just don't know any better. But it's not a fake dog. It's not a fake dog unless it's a robot in fur. There's no such thing as a fake service dog. There are people who lie or people who don't know any better. Um, <clears throat> the Department of Veterans Affairs has a document called VHA Directive 1188. I forgot to put the link in there. However, one thing you need to remember, and it actually states it in that Q&A document that I uh, uh, read you from at the beginning. Um, uh, question 36, the second to the last question on that Q&A is, do federal agencies such as the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs have to comply with the ADA? The answer is no. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 is the federal law that protects the rights of people with disabilities to participate in federal programs and services. Now, all federal facilities fall under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, not under the ADA. Most federal facilities choose to follow the ADA. The VA, being the unique organization that they are, choose to try to stick it to veterans any way they can. However, if you Google VHA Directive 1188, uh, <clears throat> and I apologize I didn't get the link in there, VHA Directive 1188 and the subsequent links within it to the federal record is the VA's rules on access with a service dog. And I'm going to paraphrase, but essentially, essentially what VHA Directive 1188 says is that the VA will parallel the Americans with Disabilities Act in regards to access to VHA property, Department of Veterans Affairs property, with a service dog. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you that the VA also leaves itself a loophole. And that loophole is, and that we're seeing this in California right now, um, the, uh, the loophole is that uh, the, there are certain areas on, VH, on VA property that uh, service dogs can be excluded, specifically um, sterile procedure uh, rooms, such as operating theaters, uh, isolation rooms like the... Uh, um, ICU, and then they put this little catch-all phrase, and other, uh, not limited to, but including these, these locations. So in California right now at the Loma Linda VA, um, one of those uh, in, including but not limited to locations is the emergency room. Yes, thank you for the link, Janice. That is the, that is the, the up-to-date policy. So Loma Linda has decided, and, and many VAs on the West Coast have decided that one of those areas where they can exclude service animals is the emergency room. Now, me personally think that's really stupid because the last place you want a disabled veteran who most likely has PTSD, and that's why he has that service dog, 
where he doesn't have access to his service dog and he's in an incredibly high stress situation and he's ready to pop is guess where the emergency room speaking from personal experience if i'm in the emergency room at the department department of Veter veterans affairs it's really freaking serious it is an emergency i am in pain or i'm dying because i'm too damn stubborn to go other times so you want to keep my 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 service dog away from me in that situation they come up with all kinds of great excuses well let me let me use personal experience again there's a little scar right here on my forehead right there it required six stitches um i was splitting wood and cracked a branch and a branch jumped straight up and cut me in the head skeeter and i got in the truck drove to the local the local civilian emergency room because the va the nearest va emergency room is three and a half hours away i was in northern michigan the nearest va ER was in Saginaw, much further south. <clears throat> I went in, said, I, I need stitches. Doc says, you sure do. They lay me down on a table. Skeeter goes on my left side, butting his head up underneath my hand to comfort me because I'm freaking terrified of needles. And the doc sits on my right side, leans over. Skeeter's butting his head under my hand. So what do you do when a 100-pound dog is insisting you pet him? You pet him calms me, lowers the adrenaline, releases the endorphin, medically proven, this calms you. And I'm sitting here petting my dog. Now this guy's stitching in my forehead where I can see the needle. And I'm going, did you numb me? No, nah, I didn't have time. Okay. I'm terrified of needles. I've had nurses ask if they needed to have uh, uh, orderlies come in and hold me down. And I'm sitting here petting my dog while this guy is sewing me. The reason I'm terrified of needles is when I was four, I got a split lip that had to be sewn. And the doctor didn't wait for the uh, Novocaine to kick in. I still remember that. I was four years old. I hate needles. This dog's sewing me with no numbing and I'm fine because I'm petting my service dog in an emergency room because it's not a sterile environment. But the VA being who the VA is, they're gonna make their own rules. There's a VA in West Virginia that is running an illegal service dog registry and will not allow veterans access with their service dogs if they do not submit to the registry. It's a violation of VHA Directive 1188 and, this, and the, and the uh, federal record. It is in direct violation. The federal record and VHA 1188 says specifically, staff may not require certification, identification, or documentation for a service dog. And yet this VA is running a registry and claiming they're within the, 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 the lines of the directive. So my advice to the VA is make sure you fulfill the requirements of the ADA. Your dog is under control at all times. The last place you want your dog to bark is at the VA. No matter why, just don't do it. Dog is housebroken. Dog is task trained. Dog is clean. Just keep your nose clean at the VA. And I have seen countless veterans abusing their rights at the VA, <clears throat> taking untrained dogs and taking emotional support animals. And the biggest problem we have at the VA, we've caused ourselves. We need to fix that. Uh, Tadsaw.org. Yes, Melissa, thank you. Tadsaw is the organization I uh, recommend the most. Janice, let me look at this case real quick, if it'll pop up. I might be familiar with this. So this is one of my favorite cases um, for California, and it brings up a lot of, uh, <clears throat> it's an appeal that was held up in Los Angeles. Um, and I can send you some more material, but you know, once you digest it, it's, it's quite long. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's about a child and his stepfather that uh, you know, trained their own dog. Mm -hmm. but um, without any knowledge, competency, or understanding of how to do so, and therefore, um, you, know, you know, they claimed that it was a service dog in training, um, but again, you must be with somebody that has the competency to say that this dog is a service dog in training and uh, mm -hmm. can attest to that. So it's an interesting case, um, and I thought yeah. you might enjoy reading it. Um, yeah. I'd be happy to talk offline with you with more information uh, I actually, do you have a YouTube channel? Yeah, PTS Dog. Okay, so in 2017, 
I didn't know who you were before I got online. Um, I, I I'm, wasn't sure what to expect, uh, but I was interested that it's a service talk training. I have so much of your material. <laughs> okay. Oh, written, great, out, great. written out in my operation plan, my guide, everything, the collaborative and cooperative training uh, part of it. Th this is all your words. Oh, yeah. I'm, well, like, I, I'm I in actually, shock. I was just sitting here like in this yeah. like awe today. I actually published that. Uh, I, I published the excerpt from my book on the, in the PTS Dog group for anybody to use. Uh, as long as they, as they give me credit, I don't care. Um, I, I cannot believe this. Like, I have no idea. Like, I feel like I'm like with a celebrity and I do not get excited. Uh, I'm not a celebrity. I'm <laughs> no, just... No, I'm not even, well, I'm not even joking. I live in Hollywood. I could care less. I am so excited to know you. Here's why I created PTS Dog. Here's why it all started. I'm handling Skater. We're working together. This is roughly 2015. Roughly 2015. So uh, three and a half years public access. And I'm realizing nobody around me knows jack about surface dogs nothing i got hassled i got hassled every time i walked into a store i got veterans left and right going how do i get that what do I, how do i get a surface dog what do i do and nobody knew anything about it and there were very few organizations out there saying anything except well you can get one from us our way is the only way and there are a lot of organizations out there with big names with large budgets who spend a lot of money to try to convince everybody they're the only way to and do it. And Companions for Independence, I'm saying it right now. <laughs> I didn't say that out loud. <clears throat> America, ADI, Assistance Dogs International, is a I like ADI. I'm just going to make the disclaimer right now. I like ADI. I, I dislike ADI. You know why? Because, <laughs> okay, I know. <laughs> because ADI says that what their tasks are are the only valid tasks. So like Skeeter's task of greeting people correctly in order to create a bridge, in order to alleviate my social disability, my, my social uh, distancing problem, yeah. my, 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 my uh, isolation, okay? That is a direct task that specifically affects my disability. But according to ADI, that's not a task. Who are they to say- Wait, 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 what, was, what, was, what was the one? I'm sorry. The way he, the, I taught him to greet people appropriately in order so that I could interact with them. Yeah. Which overcomes social isolation, which is a severe symptom of Oh, and they're saying that that's not a direct relation to you. That's, well, yeah. yeah. According to well, ADI, I that's like, not I a like a lot. Let me, let me put it out there that I really do like ADI. Not everybody is perfect. Um, but again, an ADI requires three tasks, not just one. Yeah. Um, and you the had, long, mentioned, and you yeah, had yeah. mentioned it's a good thing to, to say that there's two, but we all know yeah. that ADA only requires yeah. one task. Yeah, the, oh, the law requires one task. Now, if you only right. train your dog, look, if that's all you need, okay, that's okay. However, right. if you're only training your dog one task, I'm going to question you. Absolutely. And question that's you. Absolutely. Because you don't just have one symptom. Nobody no. does. No, and you know, that's one you know. of the things when it comes to applying for the benefit. And I, I'm, I'm glad that you recommended Tadsaw. And again, I, I think you and I, I would love to have uh, additional conversations offline. I'll make an appointment a month from now if you don't have time, but I really want to continue contact this me, conversation. <laughs> contact me versus, versus via the, the PTS no. dog Facebook page yeah. anytime. Yeah, it would That's be great. That's why it's there. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll shut up. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So, so what I don't like about these large organizations, and there's a new one on the block. They've been around for a little more than three years. They call themselves the Association of Service Dog Providers for Military Veterans. I don't yeah. like them either. Now, th there's only one good thing about the Association of Service Dog Providers for Military Veterans. They want to unseat ADI as the required program in order to yeah. receive benefits for your service dog and under the VA. Now, I, I approve of that. Here's why. Assistance Dogs International is an international organization. It's, it's, it's a foreign company. A foreign company is absolutely no business determining policy under the American the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Do you know how they got that position of being able to determine policy? The Secretary of uh, the De uh, Veterans Affairs before Secretary Shinseki, and I can't remember his name, was given an ADI trained service dog. And the director of, a of ADI America at the time was a good salesman. And it was completely a backdoor buddy-buddy deal. And 
the Secretary of, of Veterans Affairs said, oh, yeah, well, this is great. No, you guys got it. Yeah, we'll use you. And it was completely a backdoor, behind the scenes, underhanded business deal. And it funneled a lot of money into ADI organizations from the Department of Veterans Affairs. I despise that. A foreign company has no business determining U.S. Veterans Affairs policies. Yet here we are. So the Association of Service Dog Providers for Military Veterans is trying to unseat ADI. That's great. However, when you look at the association versus ADI, you're just changing one same old for the other. Their rule, they're the same way. They're exclusive. They're exclusionary. Only their way is right. And if you don't do it their way, then you're not legitimate. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. Under the law, disabled people have the right to train their own service dogs, period. If you're capable, you can. If you're not capable, ask for help. Another reason I don't like either organization is because most of the money funneled for both organizations in regards to trainers, train nonprofits that use their system, use their, their certification, is focused 99% at veterans. And there are a lot of other disabled people in the United States who cannot get service dogs because so much money is funneled, funneled for veterans. Why is the money funneled for veterans? Because guys with one leg or one arm get donations. That's bigger business to draw in veterans. It gets you more donations if you play on veterans. <clears throat> that seems awful cynical. Go do a little research. You're, you'll see I'm not right. I'm not lying. And that's wrong. I think, you know, Tadsaw, one thing I love about Tadsaw is, yes, it's Train a Dog Save a Warrior. And then there's Train a Dog Save a First Responder. And then there is Train a Dog Save a Family Member. So although they still focus on veterans and first responders, they also take care of family members. They are one of the very few. I don't think there are more than five nonprofit organizations in this country that will take care of a soldier's wife or a fireman's wife, or an airman's child, but Tadsaw will. Uh, canine companions for warriors will not. So, you know, do your research. If you're looking for a nonprofit, all I ask is, look, do your research. Think about it. Think where the money goes. We can go to a whole nother way with the nonprofits, which is money. Most of these nonprofits are claiming that it costs twenty-five dollars or $35,000 to train a service dog. When you, when you donate $35,000 to a big name organization to train a service dog, you are not paying to put a dog in a veteran's hands. You're paying to run the organization. You're paying the rent on their training facility or their breeding facility. You're paying, paying for their breeding program and kennels. You're paying the salary of their CEO and their... Uh, 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 COO, okay, you're paying a lot of money for organization and a very tiny amount of that money gets into the hands of a veteran in the form of a dog. Out of that 35 or, th or 25 or $35,000 that it, they claim it takes to train a service dog, roughly three to $5,000 is, is actually applied. Now, Flip it upside down. Put the dog in the veteran's hands immediately. This is your dog. You're responsible for feeding him. We'll help you with some veterinary to, to, to get go. But 24-7, you're housing and feeding that dog. I don't have overhead then. All I'm paying for as a cooperative training organization is the trainer's hours. Those trainer's hours may be anywhere, you know, with, the, with classes, the veteran coming and attending training classes, which you can do in a city park, un unless the Rona is involved. Um, so what are you paying for? The trainer's hours. So you can fully train a team, veteran and service dog together for about $2,500, including organizational overhead, because where's your focus? Paying the trainer to train the veteran and the dog. That's where the money's going. Tatsaw has 12% overhead. 88% of the donations go to paying trainers to train veterans and their dogs together. Makes a whole lot more sense and has effective to reach out to a lot more people, a lot more veterans. 
<clears throat> yes, oh. there is an organization. Mark, good question. Mark says, are there organizations that provide grants to have a veteran pay a trainer for cooperative training? I know of one. And I love these guys. I work with these guys. These guys help me raise the money to buy my puppy to train as my next service dog. $1,800. The Jaeger Foundation. The J-A-E-G-E-R foundation.org. What they do is they cut through the red tape. Um, one of the founders, disabled veteran, trying to get a service dog, goes to apply to one of the large name organizations, gets a stack of paperwork this thick to fill out. And, he's, and, and, so, and told there's a two year waiting list. That's the other benefit to cooperative training. Most of these big name organizations that charge $25,000, $35,000 per dog have a two or three year waiting list. I personally know a veteran who was strung on by an organization for seven years. Well, one of the founders, the founders of the Jaeger Foundation, John, looked at the, looked at the, the representative from this, from this organization and said, well, what am I supposed to do until then? Just not commit suicide? I need help now. Well, that's what the Jaeger Foundation does. <clears throat> they provide grants to connect veterans to dogs and trainers to go through cooperative training. I support Jaeger Foundation fully. Like I said, I, I, when, when they came to me on the service dog show, my radio show, um, and explained what they were doing, I was like, wow, this, we need this. This is absolutely needed. I'm going to use you guys. Came to them a year later and said, it's time for me to get a new dog. They did everything they could. I, I, now, they don't ask the veteran to help raise funds. I volunteered to help raise funds. I helped them raise the money. They gave me $1,800. I gave it to the breeder. I brought home a puppy. Um, now, I'm an exception. I'm an exceptional case because I do know what I'm doing. I, know, I do know how to trade my dog. I've successfully done it. You know, I've got Skeeter over there in the corner. Um, so they knew that they weren't going to have to, you know, find me a trainer and all of this. Plus, she's a puppy. So she's not going to be ready for training, training for a while. It's going to take a year just to get to the, to the uh, um, seniority. Janice, yes, Semper Fi Fund does do grants. Um, there are some, there's some, question, there's some questionable, questionable things going on in Semper Fi Fund in, in regards to where money actually ends up. Um, that question where, was asked. I'm aware. I have a, yeah. uh, a, a Marsoc Marine that received... He's uh, 280 pounds and he received a 30 pound dog for mobility assistance. Yeah. No. And you know, but honestly, they do do it. <laughs> with the dog, yeah, they do it. But here's the problem with Semper Five Fund is they're, oh, they're, they're, they're big on bells and whistles. Oh, Hey, well, you, Hey, here's five grand. We'll give it to these guys and they'll help you out. And they don't look at, they just look at, what's shiniest, not what's the best process. I'm aware. So, I'm aware. But you know yeah. what? One thing about but, that is they're very liberal in the fact that they're not discriminating against anybody. Yeah. They're just accepting yeah. the fact that if you are saying that you need a service dog to be trained and you have a nonprofit organization that provides the training for free to the veteran, they will give mm -hmm. it out. So they're not responsible yeah. Yeah. for ethically and, and creating standards, which is kind of what we're talking about with ADA. And yeah, not allowing yeah, and, and, ADI to be the, the full standard, you know. Of yeah, organizations should have standards. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Organizations should have standards as, as if they're taking responsibility to train veterans in their service dogs. Okay. But who, who, there, but who gets to make what those standards are? The standards should be that, they, that the dog and the handler meet the requirements of the law. That's the standard. How you get there is up to you as long as you meet that standard. So I, and, what I really like about um, the DOJ and ADA, um, I'm all, I used to work at a law firm too, and um, what I really love about um, the ADA is that it's very broad and abstract, but you know, in any law or anything that's done by federal government has a requirement to be um, easily readable by a reasonable person. Yeah. A yeah. reasonable person and in interpretation and just because the general public expectation or the general public has been desensitized about what the actual public expectation is does not mean, therefore, that the public expectation has lowered. So right. the, you know, the influx of all these undertrained slash fake service dogs that have been going out there, and it, and it really has caused such a, a, like, a, 
a, a really bad um, environment for. Oh, absolutely. Right. I've been so, on the receiving end of that multiple times. Oh, me too. I mean, it was you know? awful. You know, I've had to do I've the fifty thousand dollars. DOJ is going to come after you. <laughs> yeah, I actually had I actually had a law student from UCLA tell me that Skeeter couldn't possibly be a service dog because he's a Malamute. And well, my look at my husky. Was, look at my yeah, husky. My, yeah, my response was really. He's not trained to, to perform worker tasks to help me with my disability. You could have fooled me. No, okay, I always tell people, right. I always warn people, don't get a husky. But yeah, I tell people, I'm going to listen to yeah, my own recommendation. Don't get a malady. Don't get a husky. Don't do it. If you don't understand the breed, by all means, do not get do one. Do not do, do it. it. And yeah. in addition, don't get a golden retriever either. Yeah. You need to understand. You, look. It, at the beginning, I talked about how I, I think it's ass backwards that service dog is the last resort. Right. Okay. Now I'm going to contradict myself. If you are not ready to fully engage and take on the responsibility mm -hmm. of training that dog appropriately and everything that entails, and we're talking about, and I get into this in my book, we're talking about going as deep as when this happens, this is how I react. This is how the dog could intervene. But I have to think about why PTSD is making me respond that way. In order to decide how to train the dog to interact with me, to redirect me, refocus me, so that I don't get to the point where I fly off the handle. That's hard thinking. That's cognitive processing. That's deep mental things. You have to be to the point where you are ready to make those in-depth evaluations, bold, right in the mirror evaluations of yourself, your motivations, and your actions in order to um, train the dog to respond appropriately, to help you so that, so that you don't have those reactions. You don't go flying off the handle. You don't lose control. Um, and, and so the, 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 introspection with which you have to be prepared to take. I was at the lowest point in my life. There was nowhere I could go. I had two choices, a bullet or something else. The dog was something else. That's where I was in my life. Okay. That was low. I was at that point. I've been at that point a couple of times, three times since I decided to train a service dog. My service dog has literally climbed into my lap pushed the knife out of my hand, pushed the pistol away from me on the table, has physically intervened and saved my life. Okay, service dog doesn't cure you. It doesn't fix you. It gives you better tools. It re returns independence to you, but you still have to work. And at the end of the day, what, what kept me from taking my life back when at the beginning was I got up to take care of my puppy. Okay. I got up to take care of my puppy. That was my mission. Take care of my puppy. And then it began, train your puppy. And then it began, train your dog. And then it began, now start taking your dog out and using your dog. Okay. So I went from, fuck this up, I'm done. Excuse my French to, well, there is something to do. I do have a reason to live. I've got a reason to get up this morning. Okay, I need to give you some links. I don't have a RIP website right now. I apologize. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Okay, these... Uh, stop that. Sorry, my mouse is, is a character. All right. Well, these while we're two. waiting for that, Joaquin, can you tell us the names of your books and your YouTube yeah. channel again? Yeah. So, PTS Dog, Post Traumatic Stress Disorder and the Service Dog is the first book. Uh, it is in paperback, Kindle, Nook, um, uh, uh, the, the, whatever the, uh, the I format is and the Canadian format for eBooks. Uh, the second is why is that doggy in the store? I have, I have a copy across the room. I can't give it to you, can't show it to you. That was written by me and illustrated by Coast Guard veteran uh, Carla Nimitz, uh, who she just did. She did the lion's share of the work. The words were difficult, but they weren't that difficult. Um, she, her, her, uh, her illustrations are phenomenal. She absolutely made 
a great idea into something beautiful. And I, I couldn't be more grateful to her for that. Uh, okay. Both are available on Amazon. You can also get copies of the PTS dog book at um, booklocker.com. That is my publisher, barnesandnoble.com. Uh, pretty much anywhere you buy a, a hardback book or in the e-formats. Um, hang on a second. I'm trying to pull up my YouTube channel right now. There used they changed something. There used to be a button here that said my channel. Um, but I, I saw I, I looked it up and it said uh, it's like the user is caffeine. Caffeinicus. Caffeinicus. Yeah. Okay. So that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hang on. Let me. I can post it in the. There it is. I have it. Okay. Here we. I think I've got it. I've got it. Maybe. YouTube. See, I don't use the YouTube channel often enough. That's my bad. I need to. I need to get a little bit better at this. Uh, could you pass, could you put uh, that one? Uh, yeah, I just posted I'd it. appreciate that. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Sorry, I just, I honestly, there's so many different platforms, so many different places. You can also find me on Sayscape. Um, my my uh, username is PTSDog. Um, PTSDog underscore Skeeter on Instagram. Um, I also am the... Uh, host of the service dog show we are sundays at 8 p.m on dvradio.net you can also listen on the live 365 and the um tune in apps uh you can find podcasts on the dv radio channel on podbean stitcher itunes pretty much anywhere you find a podcast uh look for dv radio I'm one of the radio shows under DV Radio. I've been doing a radio show for two years now about service dogs. Um, what, where else? Uh, also, service dog show uh, Facebook page. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think that's it for social media right now. Um, I'm, as much as I loathe Facebook, it's the place where I can reach the most people. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, you're oh, and the P, the PTS dog group. That is a group. It is not private, but that is a group created by me for the page where we can get more in depth in regards to training questions, health, you know, uh, who, where do I find the best boots, stuff like that. To keep that, that kind of interpersonal interaction, kind of silly stuff off of the main page. Um, one of the biggest resources I published, honestly, uh, PTS Dog is the name of the Facebook page. P-T-S-D-O-G. Honestly, if you go through the notes section of the PTS dog page and read it from the very beginning, you've read my book. Just about everything that I've published in the book is published in the notes section in it in one form or another. You don't have to buy the book. However, it's pretty cheap on Kindle. It's not that expensive. <laughs> um, well, well, the children's, Kate, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to jump in. We're, wow, We're over time. Was... I know. This There's was a, lot. a fantastic class. <laughs> as much information that, that was in that class, I feel like we just scratched the surface. Yes. Um, there's, this clearly is a big, big topic to wrap your hands around. But um, thank you so much for sharing just your knowledge, your insight, your wisdom, your experience, all of that. Um, I know it was much appreciated. It's going to be much appreciated by people who watch the video. Um, thank you all who attended. I appreciate that. Um, that you came Thanks for and, putting this together. Absolutely, absolutely. So just so you know, I'm taking a break from um, putting together the Zoom groups, the 22 until none Zoom groups, till after September. You guys are in LA just like me. It's because we're doing a wellness event, an online wellness event at work, UCLA, VFWC, the Veteran Family Wellness Center. Um, we will have goodie bags, virtual goodie bags. Don't know what that's going to look like yet, but that's going to be on September 19th. So after September 19th, I'll put more classes together. Um, but if you have any questions about, um, about any of this, um, you can feel free to reach out to me, go to Joaquin's Facebook page. Um, well, sorry, I, I found this, uh, because Tess Banco shared it on our American That's Legion. my boss. That's my okay. boss. So you, you do work for UCLA VA? I do. I do. Okay. I do. Okay. I'm, I'm the family services coordinator there. I would so. love to get your contact information if possible. Let me put it in the, we're all working remotely, so I'm not even going to bother with the um, nednet.cla.edu. I sent it to Mark. I'm going to send it to everybody now. 
Thank you. <laughs> I'm doing that to you, Mark. Sorry. <laughs> okay, it's all right. Yeah. I actually, can I ask one quick question, maybe before? Um, so I know you mentioned the differences between an emotional support dog and a uh, service dog. Now I got a, I actually got a letter from my primary physician for emotional support dog. Um, I did, a, I did get a PTSD diagnosis, both my private physician, also the VA. But when you go, like, how, how do you like? So okay, so I, and I don't have a physical disability where I need a service dog, but the emotional support dog. Um, how do you like? Do I have to show a letter if I go? I mean, I have to show a letter, obviously, right? I go, I got. Only, okay, so the only place that you can take your emotional support dog, quote unquote, is your housing. Okay, no. in which no. case you need that letter, that recommendation from your physician. That's under the Fair Housing Act. In yeah. the chat, uh, that is the second link uh, yeah. I dropped in the chat. That is the Fair Housing Act guidelines for uh, uh, what do they call it? Companion animals, I think. Okay. Assistance so animals. Is. Assistance yeah. animals. Okay. So, um, and I don't know why, but that, I don't know if that link is working correctly, but okay. um, mm -hmm. they came out with a brand new guidance, January 28th, 2020 on assistance animals and housing. Um, so for, for in order to not pay a pet fee um, because you are disabled and you are recommended a, an emotional support animal by your doctor, you have mm -hmm. to provide that recommendation to the housing. That recommendation only needs to say you are disabled and that you have an emotional support animal per your doctor's recommendation. It does not need to say what your disability is. Right. The okay. same is for flying. Right now under the Air Carriers Act, 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 you have the same for flying and it requires the same note. Service dog, now you, 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 you are not protected by the law to take your ESA to the grocery store. Federally. I don't know what California state law is. I'd have to look it up. Um, I know that in Ohio, Ohio state law protects emotional support animals and you can take Fifi the Wonder Poodle to the grocery store because it's protected by state law. The way the ADA works is the federal law is the standard. If the state law is less restrictive than the federal law, then the state law is what's in effect where you are. If the state law is more restrictive than federal law, then federal law is what's in effect. For instance, in Virginia, according to Virginia state law, in order to, for Skeeter to be a service dog, he has to have certain markings on his leash and on his vest. However, federal law says none of those markings are required and he's not required to wear a vest. So in Virginia, federal law trumps the state law. However, in Ohio, which is more permissive, I could carry my cat around. I don't have a cat. I'm just using that as an example. Okay. So um, you do need, need that doctor's letter for housing. Um, now, I'm not trying to be insulting here. Okay. PTSD is just as debilitating as missing a limb. It can be. Okay. For example, with me, social isolation was so severe. I could not leave my home. So Se Secretary Shins uh Oh, dear. Uh, it starts with an S. It's not Shinseki. It's the next one. Uh, the VA secretary who, who left right after the president was elected. And I can't remember his name. Um, he instituted the program under AD, using the ADI where you could get a PTSD service dog from prosthetics. <clears throat> you have to meet certain requirements. Um, and essentially what he did was he equated agoraphobia to the physical inability to leave your home, in which case a service dog could help alleviate that. So it fall, fell under prosthetics, okay? So in wrapping your head around and understanding that, kind of think of it that way. If you're unable to go shopping because you freak out, okay, that becomes a physical disability. And you absolutely can use a service dog to assist with that. Um, yeah. So you train the dog to perform tasks that help you to do that. For example, with me, with Skeeter, teaching him to greet people appropriately, which bridged that gap with the social isolation and enabled me to talk to people and communicate. I didn't communicate before. I couldn't communicate before. I was that dark, you know, deep and dark in a rabbit hole. Skeeter pulled me out. He, he essentially, for all intents and purposes, cured me of social isolation. It doesn't exist in my life anymore, except under COVID. 
So um, don't, don't discount your disability. Um, however, also don't think, well, you know, everybody else has a dog, so I should get one. There are a lot of, there are a lot of veterans who do that. Well, that's the thing. You, you grow a beard and you get a dog. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. This is about healing. This is about moving <laughs> forward and growth. And you've got to be committed to, to really digging into yourself in order to do that healing, in order to grow, in order to move forward. And it's a painful process. Um, I recommend go to the PTS dog page. Uh, there's a note called, I believe the title is There Is No Easy Way. And uh, in the notes section of the PTS, PTS dog page, I dig real deep into the emotional, uh, psychological Okay. spaghetti bowl that's involved in training PTSD service dog. Um, I, I really recommend, uh, you know, if you feel like you might want, would you benefit with your disability if you were able to take a dog that was trained to assist you by keeping you focused more on it than on the stressing situations around you? Do you find you have panic attacks when you go grocery shopping or when you go, you know, to a restaurant? Um, you know, are you, are you having rage attacks in inappropriate places? These are the kind of things that a service dog might be beneficial to you in helping keep you focused on rather than the things that are stressing you to the point of trigger. You're focused on the dog and on handling your dog. So you don't get triggered. Yeah. That's, well, that, yeah. that's kind yeah. of the, the philosophy. Yeah. My philosophy. Yeah. There are other people, there are people who argue and they'll tell you that I'm full of shit. And that's fine. They're, put, they're entitled to their opinions. I'm sharing what my experience is and how my dog saved my life. Yeah. You know? oh, and everything you, you spoke of, I, 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 I can relate. I, like I said, I had a dog before, but it was just a dog. I, I had a pet, two yeah. pets. And it, I, the stress levels were so much different now. You know, and like even when I first got diagnosed, I started realizing you know, there were certain triggers that you're right. When you start petting the dog, it just alleviates yeah. that. Yeah. You know, you, you're right. It just focuses on the dog. And that's what I, 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 I miss that. I want to get another pet. I want to get a dog. And so yeah. I just haven't been able to because. Reach out to Tadsaw or Janice. Are you there in, uh, in LA? You're in LA, right? I want to reach out. Yeah. 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 Okay. To reach out to Tadsaw, reach out to Janice. Uh, you know, uh, there are organizations out there. And again, yeah. come to the PTS dog page, ask questions. Yeah. You can message the page at any time. I have yeah. a team of admins. If I'm not available, they are. Um, we do, it, we're not quite 24 seven, um, but we try and, we, and someone will get to you. I mean, the whole point, the whole reason I do this now is I want to help other veterans save their own lives with the help of their service dogs too. I did it, you know, with Skeeter's help, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. We all have that opportunity. That's, that's the whole reason I do what I do. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. And, uh, and I'll reach out to you too and let you know yeah. if you need a, I, I'm a web developer. So if you ever need a website, I can hook you up. Don't worry about it. Hey, uh, you know what? Please <laughs> message me because I'm getting to the point where with the way Facebook freaking squashes veteran pages, mm -hmm. I need, I need to get off of Facebook where mm -hmm. I can point people to what I'm writing without <laughs> getting crushed by the algorithms. Cause it's oh. killing me. Yeah. Oh, I'll send you a followers and I rarely reach more than 300. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'll send you, I'll send you a message and stuff. And then maybe if you Thank ever you. get a chance, I work for East LA college. I work in the veterans resource center. Maybe we do a lot of uh, uh, workshops for our vets. Maybe one day you can maybe present for us and anytime. Got it. Gladly. Awesome. Anytime. Thank you. Good to go. Thank you, sir. Well, All right. Yeah. Joaquin, All right. thank you again for everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this was clearly a class that doesn't want to end. I mean, there's there's so no, much yeah. information there's out there. So much to talk about. There's so much information. That's why and, I wrote and, a book. I'm writing another a, book, you know. See, there's a lot of bad information out there. And so I'm glad that you were here to to give us some of the, the legitimate scoop here of what, what really is true and you know separate the fact from fiction so we appreciate yeah. that so much thank you all for coming and thank i will you. be sending um the three of you emails um because i think you're all from la i'm not sure i'm gonna make sure but if you are i'm gonna send you emails and i'll, I'll let you know about future classes that are coming up and also what we do at the ucla va veteran family wellness center um anyways have a wonderful day everybody thank you for attending thank you everybody right, take care, care. Right. Right. thanks bye-bye